Okay, so first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can I just get a quick show of hands? How many of you are running serverless today or are thinking about using serverless? Okay, a couple of hands. Not the worst <laughs> I've seen. Um, so my name is Yan. I'm a principal engineer at a company called The Zone based in the UK, and I'm also an AWS serverless hero, uh, which just means I got a free ticket to reinvent this year, so hooray. <laughs> Um, so the zone, we are a sports streaming platform. We are based in London, but we do have development centers in the Leeds, Katowice in Poland, as well as in Amsterdam. And right now we support, I think, something like 200 different leagues and uh, different sports around the world. And recently we just opened up in Italy and started streaming Italian league, as well as uh, uh, boxing in the uh, US. We're available in seven different countries right now and over 30 different platforms and at peak we have somewhere around a million concurrent viewers on our platform and that number is going to grow pretty drastically in the next 12 months as we open up in I think 15 or 20 different countries next year and like everybody else here uh, we're also hiring so come talk to me. <laughs> So, about serverless, uh, uh, before I joined the zone, I actually worked for a small startup in London doing social networking. Uh, the company was called Yabo until you ran out of money. Uh, <laughs> not related to serverless at all. Um, so we were building, so we were trying to build something that's a mix of Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And it was there that I really learned a lot about how to run Lambda in production and all the different things you've got to think about when you do that. See, when I joined Yabo back in 2016, in April, we had a pretty standard, pretty simple, at least from the sort of 30,000 view, um, a very simple system with a couple of monitoring systems running on EC2 in AWS. And even being a very early age uh, social network, we have very, you know, very low uh, baseline traffic, but we had a couple of uh, big power users you know, on our platform already. At that time, I think we had less than, uh, less than 1 million uh, users on the whole platform, but Emily was one of our top users. She had about 50,000 followers at that time. She joined us uh, from Instagram, I believe, so a lot of her followers follow her onto our platform. And like many other social media influencers, she will run campaigns on our platform whereby she will put a post and say, hey guys, vote on, my, uh, vote on this uh, post and uh, I'm going to announce a lucky winner amongst you know, those of you that voted at 10 o'clock tonight. So as you can imagine, when you do something like that, you have a very, very predictable baseline traffic all the way until just about 10 o'clock and then shebang. <laughs> you get this nice sharp uh, spike in traffic that's maybe 100 times your, what you normally see and because all of these uh, social media activities happening constantly without our control so it makes our job as engineers very difficult in terms of how do you provision resources when there's going to be all these unpredictable spikes happening all the time. So our solution was very naive. We were running our EC2 cluster on a very low utilization level so that we have lots of room to spike or to handle those spikes. And because scaling on EC2 is so slow, so we also end up scaling a lot early as well. And when you put the two things together, it means that we are giving AWS a lot of money for resources that we are just not using. By my calculation, we were using maybe about 5% of the CPU cycles that we were actually paying for. And at the time, deployment was taking about 30 minutes. And uh, I kid you not, this was 2016, the whole system has got to go down and go back up for 30 minutes of downtime every single time you want to do a deployment. And there's no maintenance screen, so when you go to join the app, you just see buffer phase, you're like, what the hell's going on? Um, so clearly that's just not good enough. And one of my favorite speakers on the speaking circuit, Dan North, once said that the lead time of someone saying thank you for the good work that you've done is the only reputational metric that matters to us. And something that's really resonated with me and has stuck with me ever since. But as engineers, our job is not done. It's not a case of, okay, I committed that, it's job done. Until our software is running production, actually serving real requests, as far as our users are concerned, we haven't done anything at all. So when I joined the company, I sat down with the team and tried to decide what do we want to do, where, where do we want to be, and what would good look like for us. So we came up with a list of criteria of what we want to be. In terms of deployment, we want deployment to be small, to be fast, and have no downtime, and we don't want to be in a situation where we have to do lockstep deployments with the front-end team because of the sheer amount of coordination and stress involved. And we also want features to be independently deployable and to be loosely coupled through events and messages. On the operational side of things, we want to cut out all the fat that we had in our AWS build, and there was plenty of that. 
And we also want to minimize the amount of energy and effort that we spend on monitoring and babysitting our infrastructure. As far as I'm concerned, infrastructure should work for me, not the other way around. And we also have a lot of technical debt we have to deal with, and why else we do that? And by the way, that's a very conscious choice of wording. You hear people talk about technical debt all the time, but something to, for something to be a debt, at some point someone must have made a conscious decision to take out some money, some debt, with a plan, so that you can get some benefit in the short term, but with a plan to pay it back long term. And that's how debt works. What we saw, uh, at least when I joined the company, was not that. And uh, so whilst we address all this problem that we inherited, we also want to deliver things to our customers. If anything, we want to deliver faster than we've ever done before. And if you fast forward just a few months, we arrive in an architecture that is both event-driven as well as service-oriented, and Lambda was the thing that glues everything together. At that point, we have around 200 Lambda functions running in production, and we were paying for Lambda about 5% what we were paying for EC2. But most importantly to me is how much velocity we're able to gain by making this move, going from doing a deployment maybe once uh, per week to production, because again, when you have 30 minutes downtime every time you do a deployment, you just don't want to deploy things very often. To the point about six months later, with the same size team, we were able to, do, to, to go up to about 100 or so deployments per month to production. And of course, throughout the day, many deployments are going out to our different various, uh, various environments, which I'll talk about later. And for the moment, we decided that Lambda is a good fit for what we're trying to do, to having that first function running in production. We have to answer a bunch of different questions of how we're actually going to do that. We have to understand how can we do testing, logging, monitoring, as well as CI, CD, and so on. Ultimately, Lambda and serverless is just a tool. And oftentimes, when we change the tools that we build and run software with, a lot of the practices and tools that we use today have to change or they have to adapt. But the principles behind them very much still stays around. Principles such as single responsibility, least privilege, loose coupling, high cohesion, and so on. And as our architecture expanded and included more and more services, we also have to answer questions around how do we do distributed tracing in this world? What about conflict management and security? So I'm just going to spend a few minutes to talk about some of the features that we were able to deliver with Lambda very, very quickly. So when I joined the company, we had a search feature already in the app, but it was basically one big regex against MongoDB, which of course did not scale at all. And so one of the things we did as part of our migrations to make sure that our legacy system, this big monolith, is publishing state changes. Anytime when you update a user state or any kind of system state, it publishes an event into Kinesis streams so that we can have a Lambda function react to those events. In this case, whenever a new user is created or they update their profile or someone follows them, we can then update a user document in Cloud Search which we can then put an API in front of that to allow you to very easily search user by first name, last name, uh, and the username, and also then we can apply various kind of a sorting based on how prominent the user is on our platform, how many people are searching and look for that user so that they show up uh, high up in the search results. At the time, we also didn't have a BI pipeline to speak of, so we built that one from, squ uh, from scratch. But again, having another Lambda function consumes events from Kinesis, and in this case, we live stream them to Google BigQuery. This was before Amazon announced the Athena, and uh, I've been using, at this point, uh, using Google BigQuery for quite a number of years now, and I love the service, it's amazing. And it, this whole thing took a couple of iterations, but the first iteration took one developer two days from the moment that we had our first discussion of what we need to build into production. And our BI guy who just joined us from Skype at the Times came to us and said, Jesus, guys, nothing ever got done this fast as Skype, which, of course, no, uh, no disrespect to Skype, but goes back to the point of the lead time of someone being to say thank you because to deliver some value to someone is the most important thing that we should aim to optimize towards. And as we get more comfortable with uh, writing Lambda functions, testing them, and also running them in production, we started to go back and tackle some of the core part of the system. Like Twitter, we had a timeline feature uh, whereby you go in and you can see all your feed of the different posts from the people that you follow. Unfortunately, our implementation was really buggy. Uh, we are, our, QA, oh, sorry, our product team had a whole spec written out about how this feature should work, and the QA team has a whole test plan on every single aspect of that, except the implementation failed every single test case, uh, so the QA team just gave up testing it from then on. 
And to make matters even more interesting, a new CTO came in and fired pretty much the entire old team that was associated with the, a lot of problems that we saw. Uh, so we came in and we were like, okay, this thing doesn't really work. Um, we don't even know how it's supposed to work. So we went back and rather than try to reverse engineer what's already there, we went back to the product team to sit down with them, really understand what it is that they want from this feature. And again, we approach it by, build, by, again, by looking at what events do we have from the system, and then we build a Lambda function to consume those events. In this case, whenever you create a new post, that triggers, that go, that triggers an event getting pushed into Kinesis and triggers a Lambda function. In this case, we're going to check who are your followers, and then for each of your followers, uh, we're, sorry, we're going we're to batch them into groups of, say, 100 or 1,000, and then for each batch, we're going to put a message into SNS that triggers and Lambda function, which would then actually take your post and add it to your followers feed, which in this case is just a very simple sorted set in Redis. The reason why we go to SNS uh, in this case is because with uh, SNS and Lambda, you get retry out of the box. So when the invocation fails here, you get three retries and then a deleted queue out of the box without having to implement it yourself. And in this case, because it's a social network, as you can imagine, the same with Twitter and Facebook, most people don't have many followers, but then you have outliers, people that with you know, 10 million followers. So you need to design for those kind of worst case scenarios. And whereby, where if this guy fails, you don't want to do the most expensive piece of work in this whole pipeline, which is figuring out who your followers are, who this person's followers are. And in this case, we can mitigate that by our failures happen at this uh, Lambda function instead. And once we have the data in Redis, we can build another API in front of that to allow you to then fetch your post and, uh, from, from Redis and uh, um, what do you call it, and then to populate various different metadata from other data sources. And as part of our migration process, we will, what we do is that we create a new API and then uh, we, will, uh, we will update the legacy endpoints to start routing traffic to the new API so that we don't have to wait for the client app to also then to start consuming the new API before we can deliver value to our customers. So let's talk about how, what, you, what you need to think about before you go to production with Lambda. I think the most important thing, uh, the most important advice I can give you is don't waste time building your own deployment framework. It's precisely, precisely the kind of undifferentiated heavy lifting that we want to move away from with technologies like serverless and Lambda. The framework that we use and I still use today is called the serverless framework. From the numbers I've seen, it's the most popular on the market as well. But Amazon also has its own framework called SAM or serverless application model. And as symptomatic of anything that's new and hyped up, you have a new framework pretty much every single week. Uh, I did a quick look around the other day. I found the Apex, Up, Cloudia, Zappa, Sparta, and many more that has uh, spawned us since the, time, the last time I checked. <laughs> I think the important thing here to remember is that uh, you should look around the different options you have and then just pick one and just mandate it on a team. What you don't want to do is uh, cause uh, friction so that when people move from one team to another, they have to learn not just a new domain, but also the new way to how do you structure your application, how do you do deployment and so on. Because all of these frameworks, they all kind of do the same thing, but slightly differently. Once you start writing a Lambda function, you also have to figure out how you can test your function. And as far as testing goes, uh, this book is pretty old, but it's still one of my favorites. It's the first, play, first time I've seen uh, what we call the testing pyramid nowadays, in terms of you have your unit test, where you test your code at a module and object level. And of course, with Lambda, you can still do the same thing. If you've got some business logic, you can wrap around that with a module, and you can write tests against it. And then you've got integration tests that test your code against code that you can't change. And since Lambda ultimately, or other, any other function as a service uh, offerings, is just a way for you to write a function that the cloud provider takes care of invoking on your behalf when some event happens. So there's nothing that stops you from still writing tests and, and uh, invoke the function locally by calling it with a stub event and context object. Now the key thing to remember here is that since the purpose of this test is to test your integration points with services that you can't change, so my personal preference is to run this test and talk into the real DynamDB table, the real AWS services that you use for the successful cases and only use mocks and stops for testing uh, failure scenarios that are really difficult to simulate. And once you deploy your functions, you need to run end-to-end -end tests as your acceptance test 
And as you go up and down this triangle, um, unit test is going to give you a much faster feedback loop, but there's so many different things you can't test with unit tests. And uh, with end-to-end -end tests, they take a lot longer to run, but it gives you much higher confidence that what you've got is actually going to work. And one of the key things I learned from this book, um, I guess I'll just read it because it's quite long, is that um, you shouldn't mock types you can't change because we find that tests that mock external libraries often need to be complex to get the code into the right state for the things that we want to exercise. And the mess in this test is telling us that the design is not right, but instead of improving the code, we have to carry the extra complexity in both the test and the code. And the second reason is that we have to be sure the behavior we stop or mark matches what the library will actually do. And even if we get it right once, we have to make sure the tests remain valid when we upgrade those libraries. And I think in this increasingly service-oriented world that we live in, the same principles apply to how we work with services that we cannot change and can change without, our, without any notice to us. And I think fundamentally, you, have to rethink how about, you need to rethink about testing when it comes to serverless. Because when you focus so much energy and effort on testing what goes on inside the function, and you're stopping mocking out all the dependencies that you have, you're going to miss out most of the things that can actually go wrong when your function actually runs. I can't tell you how many times I will, I will implement a new feature uh, that talks, have a Lambda function, talk to DynamoDB, and my, test, my unit test runs fine, but the moment it runs in production, it doesn't work because, why? Permission was missing. Great, I go back, I fix my code, redeploy it again, run it again, still doesn't work, what happened? Oh. DynamoDB is not provisioned as part of my pipeline. These kind of things happens all the time, and all your stubs and all your mocks is not going to tell you these kind of things. And every single function needs to be configured from the, uh, from the in terms of assets, in terms of security, and, uh, and when you have so many different functions, that risk is just going to explode in your face. So as much as possible, I prefer to test things that all the way to the services that it depends on. And it's also my observation that for most Lambda functions I've seen, they are actually really, really simple. And uh, typically, they just do one thing and one thing only, and the risk of something actually goes wrong is now much, much shifted to how your Lambda functions to talking to the services that it depends on. And since the whole purpose of us writing any test at all is so that we have some working software at the end of it, I think that's the goal that we should aim for, even though sometimes you have to sacrifice the fast feedback loop that I'm sure everyone enjoys. Ultimately, I've learned this hard lesson that sometimes a fast feedback loop is telling me the wrong things faster, which ultimately doesn't help me deliver working software faster. And as uh, Paul Johnson mentioned here, that, that if, you're talking, if you're working with services that just doesn't work very well in this, in this scenario, then uh, you can always find another one that you can use instead. And also going back to the same book, we'll, another passage is here I uh, really like is that wherever possible, an acceptance test should, test should exercise the system end to end without calling into its internal code. And end to end tests interact with the system only from the outside through its interfaces. So, from the, so going back to the search API example I gave you earlier, to run the test for this system, we will talk to the legacy monolith the same way that our client application would do through its HTTP interface, and then we will validate that after all this background processing happens within a reasonable amount of time, we can talk to the new search API and we're able to search the user we have just created by first name, last name, and username. And we can also test scenarios whereby there are more prominent users and, uh, than others and that the most uh, prominent users are showing up earlier in the search results and so on. So in this particular setup, you are running, once you trigger your CI-CD pipeline, you are testing your code locally on the CI box and they're talking to the real DynamoDBs and other AWS services, and once it's deployed, you can then talk to the real thing, deployed in the Lambda functions through its public interface, maybe through API Gateway or whatever other event sources that you're using. So in this setup, the only difference is how your code gets invoked, whether or not it's either by the CI pipeline or by uh, the event source that you're using already. So what we can actually do to make it easier for us to write tests that are reusable as both integration and acceptance tests, we will write very high level test cases. In this case, we say, whenever we hit the, uh, um, the root endpoint, it returns some warning message um, from the, 
Game of Thrones, of course. Um, and uh, in this case, we will define our when step. And inside that when step, we have a simple toggle that just says, uh, when it says handler, we invoke the code locally with a stop event and context. But once it's deployed, we can run the same test case. Again, it's very high level test case, but we're gonna talk to the real deployed API endpoint. So that brings us to our CRCD pipeline. For every single project, we have a very simple uh, convention that uh, there would be a build script, that we, or well, deployment script, which runs the unit test integration tests, and then it's gonna do the deployment using the service framework. And after that is deployed, we'll run our acceptance test to test the thing end to end. And again, the bash script is very simple. It's just using NPM to install, install um, uh, dependencies, and then to use that to drive our unit test, uh, integration test, and acceptance test. The main thing that's interesting here is that we are, rather than using the version of service framework that's installed on the box, we use a, a local um, depend, a dev dependency version that's tied to the project instead. We found that once we are tied to the particular version of service framework, when there's breaking changes, then you find yourself in a really tough situation. And uh, so we, using this very simple approach, you kind of mitigate all those version conflicts that you may have whenever the service framework introduces a new major version. And because it's a simple script, it also means that I'm not tied to how I'm not tied to how specific uh, CI tools uh, work. So I can just um, use I can just wrap those my, uh, my 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 script in whatever CI two I want to use in the same way that with uh, Haskell architectures you want your core domain to be uh, separate in the, in the encapsulated we also want our build step to be encapsulated and uh, also then allows us to invoke those uh, build steps locally to help make uh, debugging a lot easier as for continuous delivery versus deployment we are doing continuous delivery whereby we use a git flow, and the moment something goes uh, through the whole process of being co-reviewed and merged into master, it kicks off a build to the dev environment where it runs unit tests, integration tests, deploy, acceptance tests, and then gets promoted to the next environment all the way to just before production where it's someone clicking a button. And the reason why we're holding back going to full continuous deployment is because a lot of the tests on the mobile devices were not automated yet. We were in the process of making those automated tests so that we can run them as part of the pipeline. And also because, like most startups in London, we have this thing where we drink, uh, we have uh, Friday night drinks, uh, so you really don't want to do deployment and drinks <laughs> together. Uh, once certain things deployed, you want to make sure that you have a way to, go, um, to monitor your system with logs. Anything you write to the console out from Lambda gets recorded into CloudWatch logs and you get some additional data as well. But CloudWatch logs is really bad for search. So what most people do is they go into the console, they say, I'm gonna take this log, I'm gonna shift it, I'm gonna send it to a Lambda function, and then from there I'm gonna pipe it to whatever log aggregation service I want to use. This approach works fine when you're not at scale. At scale, because uh, CloudWatch logs is an async event source for Lambda, it means you can actually run our invocation uh, limit on the lambda and get throttled. So at that point, at scale, what you should do instead is to have CloudWatch logs so send their uh, logs to Kinesis stream and then use that to call lambda function because between Kinesis and lambda is one invocation per shard so you can control concurrency with the number of shards you have in the stream. Another thing to keep in mind is that every function you create, create a new log group in, lambda, uh, in CloudWatch logs so you don't want to have uh, someone have to manually you know, do the steps to subscribe your log group to a Lambda function. And what you can do is you can automate that with CloudTrail and then use that to match against the create log group called the ABI called the Lambda, fun Lambda service calls for you. And then you invoke another Lambda function whose job is to then subscribe this new log group to your log shipping function. And you can also automate that again using the service framework and specify the event source. Another thing to keep in mind uh, with CloudWatch logs is that by default, logs are set to never expire. So if you're shipping your logs somewhere else already and you're paying for this guy per gigabyte per month, uh, it doesn't really make any sense. So use the same pattern and then update every new log group uh, to have an expiry date for like seven days or something. So now that you've got all your logs in one place so they can search easily, what about tracing? Back to the example whereby I publish a post and then it ends up in someone's feed, what happens if it doesn't work? How do you then debug this when it comes, when you consider that uh, so many different functions in different places have to process the data all the way through uh, to someone else's uh, feed API? In microservices, you solve this problem using correlation IDs. The interesting thing here is that 
Most of these uh, communications happen through async event sources such as SNS and Kinesis. So your code and IDs have to flow through these async event sources as well, which is a lot more difficult compared to a more synchronous communication via API, HTTP APIs. The way to approach this is you can create your own wrappers around HTTP client as well as SDK client so that you can automatically forward correlation IDs. In this case, whenever from our legacy system we publish the Kinesis, we use a wrap to, um, uh, our own wrapper for the Kinesis client to then public, uh, to forward those correlation IDs on. And the same goes to when you talk to SNS or when you make uh, API calls to HTTP endpoint. At the zone, I also, I also wrapped around some, a lot of these ideas into a reusable library so that our guys can uh, you know, write the Lambda function with middlewares that we automatically inspect the event that's coming in, extract the correlation IDs and make it available for our logger, but also all of our AWS key clients so that as soon as you make a call to another endpoint or another service, you automatically forward those correlation IDs on so that you don't have to do anything yourself to, be con to consciously you know, take correlation ID from one place and shift it on somewhere else. As for tracing, you can use X-ray integration with Lambda directly, and if you take the time to instrument your code, you also get a very nice breakdown in terms of what's happening inside that Lambda function, but also in other functions that you're calling through API Gateway. And you also get this uh, service map uh, so you can see the different things that you're talking to. Unfortunately, X-ray doesn't span over asynchronous event sources like Kinesis and SQS and SNS, and that's one of the gaps where providers like Epsigon is doing a really good job of in terms of plugging that gap and making a really good tracing solution that supports both AWS but also other providers and async event sources. And then we also have for monitoring and logging. We have this whole industry that's built on top of having been able to put run agents and demons on your containers, on your VMs, and with Lambda, there's no way for you to install those guys anymore. Fortunately, you do get quite a lot of uh, metrics out of the box from CloudWatch, and some of the other providers also started to support uh, Lambda by more or less consuming the same metrics from CloudWatch, but giving you a better looking dashboard instead. There's a couple of exceptions, IOPI being one of them, whereby they give you a wrapper library to wrap your code around so that they can intercept function invocations and when it accepts, when it uh, returns. And they also track uh, some additional data points such as CPU use and memory and so on. The problem with their approach is that with Lambda, you also lose the ability to do background processing. You can't just say, I'm going to run some code in the background so that it doesn't impact my critical path. With Lambda, your invocation, everything you want to do has to be done inside that invocation, including anything providers like IOPI wants to do to send metrics to their own backend systems. That means your function takes longer to run, therefore your user is having to wait longer for a response that comes back. You might say, sure, that's maybe, what, 10, 20 milliseconds, so it's no big deal, but when you're dealing with microservices, where services can call other services and hold a very long call chain, those 10, 20 milliseconds per function can start to add up very quickly. And uh, Amazon found that a few years back that as much as 100 milliseconds can uh, cost them 1% in sales. So what a lot of people can do, what you can do instead is, uh, and this is something that Datadog does out of the box, whereby you can write your custom metrics as a, a specially formatted log message so that they can process it and turn it into metrics. And of course, you can do the same thing yourself or use one of the providers that are focused on serverless already, and this is what they, they tend to do as well. And once you have all of your metrics, don't forget to put them into a nice looking dashboard. Okay, we are... Just about on time, I think. <laughs> so fine, the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, config management. And I think the important thing here is that uh, you want to design for be able to very easily and quickly propagate any kind of config changes. Again, with Lambda, you can have uh, environment variables that get back into the function when you deploy them. But it, environment variables make it very difficult for you to share configurations across multiple functions. And also, because they're baked at deployment time, so you're kind of tying who's, uh, your ability to deploy the function with your access to whatever sensitive data that may be. And the approach that we decided to go with was to have a centralized config service, and I looked at console and SCD at the time. I didn't fancy the idea of them because, A, it, goes, it takes me back to the land of having to manage cluster of machines, and I would pay for all these machines so that I can have a, a high availability, but also there's a certain uh, um, learning curve with the, both the service itself, but also with the CLI tools and so on. 
So at the time, this was back in 2016, we built our own very simple config service using API Gateway and Lambda. And since then, Amazon had announced the SSM parameter store and also recently a new service called the Secrets Manager, which also supports the rotations as well using Lambda functions. So you can use the, these services out of the box. In this case, you want to make sure that any sensitive data you have are encrypted in flight as well as at rest and that you have a role-based asset so that someone can just take those secrets with them on the laptops when they leave the company. With uh, both SSM Parameter Store and Secrets Manager, you can have an admin person to store those uh, uh, secret data, uh, those sensitive data, and have them be encrypted by KMS so they're encrypted at rest. You can either have them being baked into the Lambda function as environment variables at the uh, deployment time, or what I prefer to do instead for sensitive data at least is have them being fetched at cold start time. So when your function starts up the first time, it's going to talk to SSM, get the data, and then so, you only, so it's only available in memory as opposed to in environment variables where attackers can then quickly scan and, and then send it back to their, their layer. But that means you have to have a robust uh, client library that can do the fetching and caching and so on, cold start time. Uh, but fortunately, you don't have to do it yourself. The, this uh, MIDI, uh, middleware engine, which has got uh, middleware that you can use out of the box, which makes this a lot easier to handle. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you guys for, for listening.